Um, okay. The Circle Program in Law and Society was established in April 2001, and I know that there are non-law, uh, non-law um, communities here, so you might be wondering what we mean by law and society. Um, in a nutshell, in very general, very general terms, um, law and society is an approach to the law that asks how legal systems operate within its social setting. So instead of asking what is the law, it asks what does it do and how. In the introduction to their reader, the law in many societies, co-edited by two of our panelists tonight, um, Professor Wilhelm Leopold and also Professor Mario Gomez, together with Professor Lawrence Friedman, they write, what holds a legal system decisively it's not so much its tradition, formal juridical norms, habits of lawyers and jurists, or the rules and code of the statute books, but more the culture, the economics, and political structure of that country. A legal system is a moving, functioning machine. What makes it move is not text and words so much as the social context, the legal culture, the society itself. And tonight we pose those questions about Venezuela. The Venezuela is the fifth largest oil export in the world, holds the second largest reserves in the world, and supplies about 13% of daily oil imports to the US, yet almost 30% of its oil imports. President Hugo Chavez was first elected in 1999, and was exactly a month and a day ago elected for another term, making him the second largest, uh, second longest serving president in the history of Venezuela. In that time, Venezuela has seen a series of important changes to the operation of its legal and political institutions. And tonight, our three panelists will discuss some of these changes in relation to justice system, social policies, and freedom of speech. And each panelist will speak for 15 minutes, followed by your day. So, uh, if you allow me to introduce all the speakers, the speakers first, before um, the panel begins. So our first speaker is Anna Christina Nunez Machado. Uh, she obtained her JSD, a JSN degree earlier this year and is currently a JSD candidate here. She has a law degree from the Catholic, Catholic University um, in Venezuela. She has vast experience in the television broadcasting sector and has appeared before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on Human Speech Issues. Tonight, I'm going to present her skills research on the status of free speech in Venezuela in light of the policies of the Chavez administration. Uh, then, the next panelist will be Professor Torres <coughs> Perdomo. He is a leading law and society scholar across the Latin American region. A founder and former dean of the Universidad Metropolitana Law School, in Caracas, Venezuela. He has also taught for over a decade at Stanford Law School. He has written widely on legal education, legal profession, and criminal justice reform in Latin America and the United States. Tonight, Professor Perez Perdomo will discuss the rise of violent criminality during President Chavez's long tenure and his assessment of justice reform issues. And last but not least, Professor Manuel Gomez, He's an associate professor of law at Florida International University. He currently serves as the Florida International University College of Law's coordinator of international legal projects and leads the Global Legal Studies Initiative. Uh, before joining FIU, Professor Gomez was a lecturer in law and a teaching fellow for our schools program, and prior to that, he obtained his JSD and JSM degrees here. He also led a working group on law and policy in Latin America, sponsored by the Center for Latin American Studies. Tonight, Professor Gomez will discuss the impact and the use of President Trump's social program, starting with the Bolivarian Mission. So please join me in welcoming all of us. Here for my master's degree here at Stanford University um, for the skills program. 
So uh, it basically touches on the issue of free speech in Venezuela and, and how it's been affected during the, his years under the Chavez administration. Uh, so I first want to provide you with a general outlook of uh, what's been happening with free speech in the country. Um, so free speech is very broadly provided for in the Venezuelan constitution. It's protected. Uh, it is legally protected both under the, the constitution and uh, international conventions ratified by Venezuela. Um, so it is, I think it's safe to say that at least legally, freedom of speech uh, enjoys the highest degree of legal protection that you can uh, be afforded any right under, under the Venezuelan legislation. Now, this constitution that I'm talking about is a 1999 constitution, which I think it's important to know that it was approved under uh, the Chavez administration. So he was the one who proposed the text of the constitution, was a strong supporter of the constitution, he campaigned for, uh, for the enactment of the Constitution, uh, and in fact, the Constitution was approved, and at least with, in the part dealing with human rights, it has been, um, it has been celebrated as a very modern Constitution, uh, very positive in protecting human rights, uh, and in protecting freedom of speech. At the time when the Constitution was enacted, this was back in 1999, uh, Hugo Chavez had a very close relationship with the media in Venezuela. He was a supporter of the media, very close ties with the media. Most of the media had supported him during the campaign. And in general, there was an amicable and peaceful relationship between Chavez and President, then candidate Chavez, then President Chavez, and, and the media. Um, nevertheless, in a very short period of time, relationships began to uh, be affected. And um, in a very short period of time, President Chavez declared independent media in Venezuela one of the main enemies of, of the revolution. Um, this was also this was also happening obviously through the whole period where uh, checks and balances began to uh, start to weaken, and um, some commentators uh, started to uh, think that Venezuela was um, ceasing to be an adequate liberal uh, democracy. So uh, freedom of speech obviously was started to be, in my view, severely affected, um, really close closely to uh, the date where. Chavez began his administration, and um, he even attempted to amend some of the provisions regarding freedom of speech in the Constitution, but this didn't go through. However, international observers, uh, the Inter-American System of Human Rights, uh, many international organizations have been monitoring the situation in Venezuela and have determined that there have been, there has been, in fact, a grave deterioration of the situation of freedom of speech in Venezuela. Uh, most basically, the, the inter-American system of human rights, which as you, most of you may know now, President Chavez has announced that we are withdrawing from the system, uh, has been really critical of the free speech situation in Venezuela. So in the midst of this situation, I'm only focusing on one of the indirect means to uh, restrict freedom of speech, um, which is called, uh, the, the word is in Spanish, which is, which is called academia. So the word cadena, translated into English, is chain. And the word chain refers to the fact that when there is a cadena, uh, all broadcast television and radio stations are forced to systematically air the presidential speech. So you're watching your program, uh, whether it's a sport match or a soap opera or you know, a news programming. And from, you know, based on the decision of the president, Everyone has to interrupt their programming and retransmit this, the presidential speech. Uh, the president decides when it starts, when it ends, the length, and obviously the topic. So all the channels, TV and radio channels, are chained together. That's where the word chain comes from. Are chained together and airing one same message. During this time, you cannot see anything else in radio or television stations. Um, so. Cadenas are not an original creation of President Chavez. Cadenas have existed in Venezuela since the arrival of, of the television uh, system to Venezuela. Um, all the presidents have used this mechanism in different periods. Typically it was used when there was a coup d'etat, when there was a national catastrophe. You would see the president coming on television with a cadena uh, explaining what the situation was. The, the term is only, or the, this mechanism is only now began to talked about just because of the reiteration of the use of the cadena under the Chavez administration. Uh, but many 
of Venezuela's most important events were broadcast to the population through the system. So for example, when, when the first time uh, the Pope visited Venezuela, we saw this through Cadena, um, when uh, uh, the oil industry was nationalized, the president announced this through Cadena. So Venezuelans are more or less used to having their programming inter being interrupted by these uh, speeches by the president. Uh, the fact that we're talking about this today is just because, again, as we will see further on, um, every day, almost every day in Venezuela now we have a cadena with, with President Chavez. So it's interesting to know that one of the most famous cadenas in the history of Venezuela happened uh, the day when, uh, February 4th, 1992, when the President Carlos Andres Perez, who's there to your right, announced to the government, to the people, that there had been an attempted coup d'etat and an attempt to assassinate the president by some uh, members of the military uh, who were, whose leader was Hugo Chavez. So, um, so the issue with the cadena with Hugo Chavez started you know, way before he won the election, just because we heard of the coup d'etat through, through a cadena. Um, so again, Venezuelans are mostly used to, to this, this um, to the system of interrupting um, the programming of television and radio. And of course, when we're dealing with this, we talk about compelled speech because radio, radio stations and television stations are bound by law to, you know, to transmit the speech, to broadcast the speech. So if they're compelled to do it by law. And should they not um, transmit the cadena, there are legal, there are legal sanctions. Um, so Hugo Chavez took office. Um, Hugo Chavez took office for the first time, uh, the second of February, nineteen ninety-nine. And on that same day, uh, there he started using these, the, the mechanism of cadenas. The cadena on the day of his inauguration lasted more than eight hours. So during the whole day, uh, Venezuelans saw the president on this first day of the administration for eight hours without being able to watch and anything else. And this, in a way show what was going to be further on the use of cadenas by, by President Chavez. Uh, from that day on, um, until, the, until 2010, which is the period which I studied, there were 2,125 cadenas, uh, which amount to 61 straight days of, of, of cadenas. Um, and then last year, President Chavez broke his own record. He, uh, in, the, in the speech he gave, which is, uh, equivalent to the State of the Union speech, he spoke for one more than nine hours straight in Cadenas. So you can understand during that whole period of time, if you want to see something different, you have to you know, go to the internet or maybe watch something on cable, because all the radio and television stations are all showing exactly the same message, which is the presidential speech. So here you have, just so you, have, you can see um, the list of cadenas per year, and maybe you can see in the, for example, in the year 2004, there were 374 cadenas, meaning that there were there was more than one cadena per day. So Venezuelans have become, uh, I guess, used to uh, having the programming interrupted, sometimes several times per day, sometimes for more than four hours. It depends on the decision of the president. Um, so um, this mechanism has a very negative effect, of course, on freedom of speech, because of, on the one hand, you are forbidden from seeing, forbidden, you are, you cannot see anything else but this mechanism, uh, I'm sorry, this, this message. And at the same time, it's obviously censoring all the other messages that were supposed to be broadcast through at that time. Um, so clearly, the, the, the issue of the cadena has a negative impact on how ideas and, and uh, you know, different ideas flow in the country when, when the mechanism is set. So uh, again, this was the research I did last year for my master's degree here, and this is the main question that I was looking into. What does the analysis of the broadcasting uh, and content of the cadenas from 1999 to 2010 tell, tell us about the presidential use of this form of compelled speech? And because we're doing law and society, as Agnes was explaining at the beginning, what I wanted to see was how the mechanism is being used, what the cadenas are saying, what are the topics that are being discussed in the cadenas, and how this reflects the legal culture uh, of the country. So I had a list of all the cadenas, uh, I, sent, I took a sample, and I did content analysis of, of, of the sample. So 
So basically, I don't want to bore you with everything that, that was happening in these um, you know, messages, but I was able to also using past literature on, on the topic because many researchers in Venezuela have studied not only the cadenas but typically presidential speeches. They have identified, and so did I, four major themes that are present in these broadcasts. So the first one is the debate between uh, socialism and capitalism. So uh, I'm giving you some examples in these slides so you can see these are quotes from President Chavez uh, in the cadenas. So the, the first thing I noticed was that the main recurring theme in this cadenas is the debate between socialism and capitalism uh, and uh, the propaganda for socialist and communist ideas um, recurrently through the cadenas. So we see uh, this debate as being uh, the debate in the country and uh, basically the precedent for supporting socialist ideas, calling people to support these ideas, and uh, to a point, um, you know, talking about socialism as, as the only solution for all the problems of, of the country. So you can see now, you know, I'm just giving you certain quotes and you can sort of see what, what the type of language that is being used is. But this is definitely, if there's one recurring theme during the Galenas is, is socialism. Uh, the second idea that I was able to identify in the cadenas, and which also has been identified by other researchers, is, is the issue of the polarizing discourse. Uh, I'm giving you three examples of how President Chavez uses this polarizing discourse, treating supporters as, as friends and family and people who criticize him as enemies. The use of military language is very common, um, referring to the situation as a war or enemies or combat. Um, and just a very critical, um, you know, um, speech about the opposition. The opposition is um, is composed from the language that I was able to identify in the cadenas by not not only the people who vote against him or the people or the members of the opposition parties, but anyone who criticizes him. And the list uh, we were able to to come up with a list of people that were signaled as being part of the opposition, and it included you know, former presidents current presidents from other countries that have criticized him, the Catholic Church, you know, the US government, uh, President Obama, President Bush, of course, and the media. So the two basic enemies of the revolution, which are mentioned repeatedly in the Galenas, are basically the media, the independent media in the country, and, and the empire, which is you know, the United States of America. So uh, this was the recurring theme number one, and I labeled it, Chavez loves you, he's working for you, and giving you free stuff. This is a quote from one of uh, the people that were, you know, that were just interviewed in one of the cadenas. In the cadenas, we just, we don't see the president only speaking, giving mm -hmm. a speech, we see him interacting with people. So you, they also interview the people he's, he's interacting with. Uh, normally, you see him working or visiting a small town or, or in cabinet meetings. Um, and we see the, the, the word love appears repeatedly throughout the Galena. It's, it's the second most used word after socialism. And the relationship between Taoists and the people is portrayed as being very affectionate, and very close. You see the people um, declaring their love for him. It's very affectionate, very close. And so does President Chavez. Um, so I gave you, I'm also showing you some, some of the quotes so you can understand what the type of language is being used. You see him hugging people, kissing people um, repeatedly. And also you see him um, working. Uh, they show President Chavez, as you can see there, trying to you know, solve problems, taking charge of situations. Sometimes a cadena will be uh, a cabinet meeting and you see him giving orders to the minister, to the secretaries, or uh, scolding someone who's not doing his job, uh, or delivering food for people who are in need. Um, and giving free stuff. So one of the things that we coded, um, and that was very interesting, was that the amount, the number of cadenas were President Chavez was actually giving something to someone. And the way they portray it looks like he's giving something that belongs to him as a gift to someone. So we were able to come up with a list of things that he was giving uh, out. And the list included cars, houses, scholarships, money, um, bonuses, jobs. Um, and they show him offering this, and of course the people being extremely um, gracious about receiving the gifts. 
Um, so this was the third major theme um, we saw in the dance. And finally, the fourth recurring theme, which sort of closes this whole pattern, are polls for people to vote for President Chavez and his, his party. Um, so uh, by law, cadenas, uh, it is forbidden for the cadenas to touch on political <laughs> issues or to make calls for voting, but uh, unfortunately the cadena is being used for precisely for this reason. So in some of the cadenas you can see a more indirect way of President Chavez on trying to get people to vote for him, but um, in many of, of those we saw direct calls for people to vote for him. So um, this is specifically troubling in times of obviously political elections, because obviously the, the opposition candidate does not have the same platform as a president to call for people to vote for him. But in a way what we see at the end is that there's a pattern where President Chavez um, is self-promoting himself, talking about socialism, offering aid to people, loving people, people love him, and at the end it all sort of closes up with, um, you know, vote for me, vote for the revolution. So what I wanted to do with this and trying to be as objective as possible, I wanted to understand whether or not this mechanism, which also exists in other countries in Latin America, was in breach of the obligations that Venezuela has uh, towards uh, the inter-American system of human rights. So actually the inter-American system of human rights has set a test to determine if these broadcasts are legal and are compatible with the, the American Convention on Human Rights. And you can see in the slide, um, I underline the, the test. The, the, according to the Inter-American Commission, these broadcasts are legal if they consist of information that has been, um, that is strictly necessary to, uh, for urgent information needs on the subjects of clear and genuine public interest and during the time that is strictly necessary. So if the cadena complies with these four requirements, it is, it is legal. So what I tried to do was, instead of myself trying to do the determination, which might be biased, Course, I tried to look at what the cadena itself, the objective elements of the cadena, were showing. So in order to see if this was information which was of genuine public interest and needed urgently to be communicate, communicated, I, I refer to the theme of the cadena. So this means that when the cadena begins, there is, a, there is an insert on, on the bottom of the screen where you see what the president believes is the theme of the cadena. And so what we were able to determine was that from the theme itself of the cadena, it became obvious that this was not information of genuine public interest that needed urgently to be communicated. So I'm giving you just some examples of this. So we had cadenas, for example, uh, to see the inauguration ceremony of some softball game, or graduating ceremonies, um, or you know, uh, a video to celebrate how Venezuelan athletes performed uh, in a specific game or uh, you know, the celebration of the day of university students. So according to the test set by the inter-American system, these cadenas would not fit the, the test. And also I wanted to look um, at to what President Chavez says and does during the cadena to be able to determine if these broadcasts fit the test which has been set by the Inter-American Commission. And in many of the cases, the cadenas did not fit the test. Of course, there are cadenas and there are instances where, in fact, President Chavez is announcing important news to the country. Um, the issue is that he spends very little time in the announcement and then the cadena goes on for, as I said, up to nine hours, where clearly what happens is something completely alien from the announcement. Uh, so as I, I show here, um, sometimes the president himself says that the cadena is not relevant. So you see here the example where President Chavez says, uh, the handout of loans for, from the Bicentennial Fund is an economic act of great importance for the whole country. They tell me that at 8 p.m. the final match of basketball will be happening. I will not affect basketball fans. I am not one of them, but long live sports, long live basketball. So during the Cadena, the president asks, he's currently, he's all the time asking if the game started, if the game started. So once they tell him the game is on, he decides to stop, to cut short the Cadena. Which I would, you know, I would think suggests that Obviously, this wasn't something that urgently needed to be communicated for the period of time that the Cadena was lasting. Um, so from those elements, um, we were able to determine that at least a great percentage of, 
public areas do not meet the test set by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And this is why this, uh, the, this body has been constantly for the last 12 years requiring from the government to, um, to deal with the issue of the cadenas in a more democratic way. Lowering the hours, lowering the, the reiteration, and only using the cadenas when there is an urgent need to communicate information uh, to, the, to the population. Uh, so before finishing, I just wanted to make a brief reference to um, the situation. This, this work was done for last year, but as you know, we had our election uh, a month ago, and I, I wanted to mention the, the, the theme of the cadena during the elections. So, as I have told you, uh, the law in Venezuela prohibits the use of cadenas for political purposes. And this is especially important in election time because obviously the opposition does not have the mechanism to use a cadena to broadcast their messages. So it creates an unbalance between the time the president is seen on television and the time the opposition candidate is, is portrayed on television. So we have the numbers here. The, 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 the campaign went on from July 1st to October 4th, 2012. And uh, during, according to the law, each candidate had three minutes of television per day. So to your right, we have um, Enrique Capriles, who was the opposition candidate who lost the election. So he was able to appear on television for three minutes per day, whereas President Chavez appeared for 28 minutes per day because he had 29 cadenas, which amounted to 45 hours uh, um, during the election campaign. And even after October the 4th, between October the 5th and October the 7th, when we had the election, where no political campaign is allowed in Venezuela, still President Chavez had two cadenas, which lasted for an hour. So you can see that the situation creates an incredible unbalance between the time one candidate is, is able to expose his message and convey his ideas and compare it to the other candidate. Uh, but this is sort of the situation that, that we're having in Venezuela now. So the, the whole idea of, the, of my research was to touch on this subject, which has not been uh, uh, you know, the subject of research, or legal research, or social legal research, and just give a description of what the reality of the has, uh, has been has been for the last 12 years. Thank you. Okay, this is a, a talk on, on uh, homicides, basically, which are a very important uh, crime, of course, and reveals a lot about the, uh, a lot of, 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 of things, but certainly uh, about uh, a country legal and, and political culture, because homicide can be related to political conflict, to racial, racial conflict, with uh, many aspects of, of life, or, uh, the suppression of a part of the population, or, uh, all these type of uh, uh, things related to homicide. And let's put the issue in Venezuela. Venezuela is, at this moment, one of, has one of the highest rates of homicide in the world. Uh, 67 uh, homicides per 100,000 uh, inhabitants. And this is a relatively new phenomenon. Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela uh, does not have a civil war or terrorist organization or uh, drug cartels conflict or, 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 or poverty. So the, 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 the poverty has been decreased in the last uh, uh, 30 years of the Chavez government. And the question is what policies have been implemented to, to control uh, violent crimes and, and uh, what is the relation with the political uh, change in the, in the country. These are the, the figures of homicide in Venezuela. From 1976, 
and you see uh, the darkest absolute figures. So the the, the, <coughs> the Hugo's relative uh, flag start raising in 1990, and uh, starting in 1999, uh, the, the growth has been exponential. And this is the comparative homicide rates with other countries. So, uh, as you see, it's not a question of ideology. Cuba and the United States have very similar uh, rate of homicide. No? And uh, uh, other Latin American, Latin American countries have uh, higher homicide rates, uh, but uh, Venezuela is really the, 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 the highest one. There are other countries, of Honduras and El Salvador, have rates that are uh, higher than Venezuela. But they have a uh, civil war uh, homicide is a very complex crime. No? Uh, it, is, it can happen for, for many reasons. They are uh, kind of the typical uh, homicide of the wife but in the husband or, or vice versa or the people that are people for, for many other, other, other reasons. And of course, uh, it's, it's a complex uh, uh, situation, and there are different definitions of, of the crime. In some cases, uh, the homicide is not a crime. For example, if you if somebody kills another person, um, uh, <coughs> the, the defense is not a crime. But it, uh, this is a, a, a complex area. In the Venezuelan statistics, uh, official statistics, the uh, people that are killed by the police are not counted as homicide, they are counted as enfrentamientos, and they are a number uh, uh, quite high uh, during the year. But, for example, motor uh, traffic uh, accidents, even if they are kind of uh, caused by negligence or, or imprudence, is, is, are not usually uh, uh, counted uh, uh, in the statistics. And in Venezuela, most of the, of the, of the homicide, in fact, are, I have put that, uh, it's very difficult to look a, a good name, because the word banal or common uh, is uh, uh, with the offensive. If, if the person that you kill is your brother or your sister or whoever, uh, but they are common in the sense that they are not uh, a kind of uh, the consequence of uh, uh, the fight of, of uh, drug cartels or, for uh, example, in Mexico, you know, homicide are spectacular. You know, they cut the head of the people. And, uh, these are kind of uh, almost gentle homicide. They say that they, they don't mutilate uh, uh, the corpse or, or, or they don't send messages with the, with the people. You know. But yeah, the typical uh, homicide is between poor people that like, you may kill it other poor you may. This is a typical uh, uh, situation. Uh, but a certain number, uh, 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 a growing number in this case, is uh, other violent crimes that become homicide because something got wrong. No? Uh, 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 attempt of kidnapping or robberies, but um, for any reason, uh, the victim Okay. The official explanation is that it's nothing new, that it's a long term trend in the Venezuelan society, which we have seen is, is not true, and that it's a war trend, uh, that violent crime rates are up everywhere. Again, it's not true. In the case of the United States, that the, that the Venezuelan authorities cite as, as, as an example, is just the reverse. In, in the United States, homicide rate has come down in the last 50 years. Uh, well, that is the figure. Uh, and these pictures, this uh, table, uh, show the, 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 the rate of Venezuela compared with Colombia that had a very, very, very high rate of homicide in the past and had been able to decrease it uh, substantially. And the, the Brazilian homicide rate of this can basically flat. 
Okay, I am particularly interested in what has been the response to the Venezuelan state to this situation. And we have uh, 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 the, 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 rise, uh, the rise of homicide started in the early 90s, long before Chavez came to power. Uh, and that was a concern on that. And this concern produced the increasing violence in Venezuela, produced uh, the uh, creation of the justice of peace uh, as a way of providing the people a way of solving conflict and, and avoid violence. Uh, that was a uh, legislation from 95. There was a reform of the criminal procedure in 98. And there was a judicial reform and a penal reform of criminalization policies and a police reform that had been done in the last uh, uh, 30 years. The justice of peace reform that uh, basically was the idea to keep peace in the community to, to avoid violence was a flow legislative procedure and had very little uh, success. Uh, only, uh, well, not, 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 this thought because we don't have much time. Uh, the situation in Venezuela, this polarized discourse by, by the president and so was, is not, it's completely antinomic to the idea of, uh, of, of, of peace. It's, uh, and let's go. And the, the most important reform was the, the reform of, of, of criminal procedure. Uh, the, the idea was to introduce a, a system uh, of criminal procedure more similar to the, to the, to the American one or, the, or accusatory procedure. But that reform was played by the increase of crime in 1999 and 2000. And we have made reforms, uh, counter reforms in, in, in both years. Uh, and the, uh, the, the idea has completely changed and the inquisitorial procedure uh, has come back. And again, the, 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 the prisons in Venezuela are full as in the past of people that are waiting to be, uh, to, 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 to have a hearing, to have a trial. That is the phenomenon called presos in condena. There are people that are technically innocent, but they are in prison uh, uh, because the, the system is very slow in processing uh, them. And the, the reform of the civil pro the, of the criminal procedure basically failed because it was necessary uh, 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 an effort in uh, training uh, judges and prosecutors and police for a new system and uh, uh, training and uh, educating <coughs> civilians in the, the population to participate. Uh, we have a system, not as a jury, the people have to participate as a part of a panel with the, with the professional ju uh, uh, judge for, for the, uh, the crimes of, of certain importance. But the people are not used to that and they have not been educated for that and they have been a, a, a source of, of difficulties for the implementation of the system. And the failure in the, in the, in the procedure, uh, in the reform, made that the police at the beginning felt that they, they were power, powerless and the, the reaction was the creation of the squads uh, and that is one of the reasons of the increase of, of, of teaching and the big problem of Venezuela of people killed by the police. And later, uh, killed, people killed uh, in, the, in the areas of, of uh, the urban areas uh, that are uh, relatively pure for barrios when, when the, the, the people stop put in prison or they, they organize uh, the lynching of, of the person. Uh, there was a, 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 an effort uh, in the late 90s of a, a, a judicial reform to, to give training to the judges and, and uh, in fact that they some of, of, of this uh, uh, administrative uh, reform uh, was uh, uh, very successful in the sense that, for example, many of the 
Supreme Court decision and other uh, court decision are now online and are very easy to consult. And uh, uh, it is more used in technology in, 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 the, in, the, in the processes. Uh, and there was an investment in training the judges, but very quickly uh, the government, uh, the, the system, uh, had interest in, in having the judges control politically, and that uh, had presented as a consequence a high rotation of, of judges. And that is one of the reasons of the failure of the, of the, of the system. The other reason is that uh, even if there was an investment on, on judges and, and the judicial system itself, not on the, on, on the prosecutor offices, and the, and the prosecutor office is the new uh, bottleneck for the, judicial, for the justice system. And of course, there is no much change in the education for, for the new system of prosecutor. And the other aspect is the, the substantive aspect of the, of the, of the uh, penal reform and criminalization uh, policies. It's interesting because the penal code was modified, but the reform was mostly for penalization of political protest. The, the, the concern of the government was not the high officer rate, but uh, criminalization of the political protest. If you, uh, the noise of casserole of, uh, of pants so as a protest. Uh, this is a crime now in Venezuela, uh, or if you saw the, the president or whatever, but there are many crimes now that are related to the to political uh, protest. Uh, there is also a multiplication of crimes that are not in the penal code. Uh, about 1,000 new types of crime have been created. In fact, it's very little. Uh, it, it's, very difficult in Venezuela to, to be in economic activity, to, to have a business and not to commit a crime. Uh, um, what happened is that there have been a persecution of, of bankers, of brokers, of military men, of politicians, and, and the students, because the, the protest of, of the students have been criminalized. It's about more than 1,000 students are now on the penal investigation in Venezuela. Uh, the, the government has been very carefully not putting them in prison for a long time, time, but they keep open the, the, the criminal investigation as a way of putting pressure, particularly in, on, on leaders of the, of the student movement. Uh, and if, when you look at the, at the, at the uh, people that are in prison, probably the, 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 a, a, a big number are not homicides, homicide uh, people, but uh, people that are in prison because they are uh, PT drug uh, traffickers and so on. But I, I have an explanation why uh, the PT drug trafficking is in the, in the, in the great crime that the police are willing to investigate and not the homicide. They prefer not to investigate homicide. Uh, it's really, they don't, they, they uh, to investigate homicide, particularly if the, of the people that commit homicide, uh, you have to look for them in, in the squatter settlements. That is quite dangerous for the police itself. No? It's better to look for, for people that have drugs in the airport or whatever. That is much easier for the police, and, and that is reflected in who is the people that go to the to prison. Well, the other thing that is very important is that the regime used criminals for dirty political jobs. The, this, uh, they were called circulo bolivarianos or colectivos. Uh, they, the, the, the government itself has, has distributed guns and motorcycles for the defense of the regime. No? Ah, okay, I will finish. Uh, and that has supposed that the paralysis of the prosecutors and judges because they have to distinguish uh, they, they should not punish the, the people that are friends of the government they, they should punish only the people that are uh, enemies and of course to make a mistake could be punished with firing of the judge or the prosecutor well I have some things on, on police reform that have been not been successful because it was more the control of 
of the municipal police. This is the, the prisons, uh, the, the, the situation of prison, prison population, how it has grown in Venezuela. By the way, it's much lower than the, the American prison population. We have only uh, about 100 uh, 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 prison, prisoners per, per 100 person in Africa. Uh, United States is the champion in the world at this respect, with about 700. Uh, but one of the problems is that the, the control of the prisons has been given to the uh, worst criminals. They are called crimes. And the, the, practically the, the, the government has renounced to control the prisons. So. And that has been uh, the reason is uh, corruption and, uh, and the lack of accountability for, of, of a piece of Importance is not uh, if it's, if it's the political loyalty. You know? And in fact, what happened is that, that uh, the prison has become extremely violent uh, and has been uh, many uh, cases of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, massacres of the, uh, within the prison, uh, uh, done by the, by the, the prisoners who went to group against uh, another. Well, uh, this is the general explanation of, of the high rise of uh, high rate of crimes of uh, homicide in Venezuela. There is a long neglect of, of uh, civic cultures and, and values. There is the destruction of institutional of social control. Uh, the police, the, pol the prosecutor's office, and the courts have been practically filled with, with uh, regime lawyers, but not with uh, uh, any preoccupation of. of uh, uh, efficiency or uh, good administration of justice. And also the destruction of social hierarchy. No? Uh, I, I can explain that by the empowering the malandros. No? This is the, the, the given these guns and, and, and importance to the to the malandros and how about destroying the hierarchies in the in the barrios, in the water settlements. And that has made the barrios particularly bad. And this is the conclusion that institutions and law enforcement and social norms matter. Uh, some people tend to, 
to equ equate the, what's going on in Venezuela with a regime that is completely outside of the law. Uh, every time the president talks and says, we don't care about the, the decision by the Internal Court of Human Rights, or we don't care about this treaty, or we don't care about that, uh, have been used to, to symbolize this, this uh, sheer disrespect for the law. But what you see, if you look at other instances, and the instances that I have looked at is uh, so our social policies, what happens at the domestic level, and uh, it's really, it's really a, 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 a paradox because the government has internally, at the domestic level, has given a lot of symbolic prominence to the law. So what I'm going to talk about today, and, and this is not going to be a, a cadena, I hope it's, uh, it's brief, <laughs> Um, it's really five points. Uh, the first point is, uh, is the Venezuelan government, unlike what the conventional wisdom suggests, has gave a, a, a central role to the law since day one. Actually, one of the main projects of the government when, when, when Chavez won the election in 1998 was the, the reformation of the state, was let's create, let's create a new state, let's amend the constitution. That was the political flag of, of the government. Let's amend the constitution. And the constitution is the, the highest law, the supreme law uh, in the state. So that's how it started. The government brought the law to everyday life. The language of rights became, or rights became pervasive. Uh, people, uh, poor people, rich people, middle class people started talking in terms of rights. The government used to use the Constitution as this very powerful tool. In, in fact, the president would brandish the Constitution, a little booklet that was sold all over uh, Caracas. And I, I have one in my office, but I forgot it. It's this little blue book. And, and people had it in their pockets. And you would be uh, out of the street having coffee, and someone would say, because we have right to X or right to Y or right to C. And this is what the Constitution says. And it was always in the political speech that rights were important. And someone, an outsider, would see this as a positive. Would say, well, what's wrong with empowering people and, and having, letting people know that they have rights? What is wrong with having uh, indigenous peoples know that they have certain rights when they, no government before would ever told them, even told them that they had rights, that they were, they were people? So number one, there is a, a, an, an incredible amount of, uh, of symbolism in, 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 in this idea of bringing the rights into the, into the common speech. Number two, an enormous amount of legislation. The government has produced thousands and thousands of pieces of legislation in every conceivable area. So it's also counterintuitive. Counterintuitive is if we are in the presence of a government that doesn't really pay attention to the rule of law. Because the evidence that you have, if you look at amount of legislation, you see that it has produced a lot of legislation. It has also entered into a large number of international agreements and treaties, at least at the beginning. Now it's trying to get out of some of the treaties. Now, now it's trying to get out of some of the very important treaties. The, the American Convention uh, is the, the last one in the screen. The, the Exit Convention was another one that was very important. But before that, the Venezuelan government was really entering into treaties at a record pace. So, so this, the, the, the law rose to prominence, at least in a symbolic fashion. What we're going to see later on is that that was for a purpose, and that was for a political purpose. So, so step number one was, let's put the law back at the center stage. So law is going to be important. We're going to look at the, the, the government or the administration that upholds the law. We really believe in the rule of law. We really believe in institutions. Who else has paid attention to institutions but us? That's number one. So number two eh, is that the government's eh, goal became early on to pay a lot of attention to social policies. So social policies so it rose to prominence in the government's agenda. Uh, it started uh, by probably serendipity. Uh, in 1999, there was a, a catastrophe in Venezuela. The landslides uh, claimed the lives of, of a lot of people. It was really, it was really a horrible natural disaster. 
It was a natural disaster that happened the day of the, the, the referendum that would approve the Constitution. So really the government was on the verge of crisis because that was the day when people were voting. That's December, 19, December 15, 1999. And so, so big, big humanitarian crisis in the country. Uh, the U.S. offers uh, support. The Venezuelan government says, we don't want any, uh, any aid from the United States. We want aid from and everybody else. Cuba offers aid. Uh, one of the, 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 the aids that, that Cuba offers is to send doctors down to Venezuela. It's a humanitarian uh, program. So Venezuela receives the Cuban doctors. The Cuban doctors help with the crisis. But then the Cuban doctors stay in Venezuela. And the Venezuelan government realizes, well, Cuba has done this before, has deployed, had deployed doctors and nurses and, and, and sports trainers in, in many other countries uh, before. So, so the Venezuelan government realizes that this might be a good niche for the government to, to exploit. So the, the social policies which had always been at the periphery become the center of the economic, uh, of, the, of the government, uh, political, government's political agenda. So three years down the line, in 2004, the government, or the pre President Chavez appears in one of those buildings and says, we have to save the people. So of course his, his speech is a very symbolic one. It's, a, it's, it's one that connects him with the the, the lay person. So he says, we have to save the people. We're going to launch, we're on a mission to save the people. And he says, this we're going to call the misiones. We're going to call it the missions. And this is when the misiones are born. So these misiones, what are the misiones? Misiones are social programs. There are more than 30 social programs uh, that address social needs in a variety of, of areas that range from health services, education, literacy programs, land tenure, protection of the environment, protection of single mothers, protection of children, protection of the elderly, indigenous rights, and so on and so forth. Anything that is social, that is, is a, it translates into a social benefit for the population, there is a mission for that. And all, the, and all of these missiones, all of these social programs have, have gotten the name of a symbolic figure in the history of Venezuela, an, an important indigenous, uh, indigenous figure. So there's always a lot of symbolism attached to it. So these missiones have been praised by international organizations, but the World Health Organization said to the Venezuelan government, this is wonderful. No one has really addressed access to health as you have. Because what really the government did was that it created Clinics. It opened up clinics in areas that had no access to hospitals. So a, a remote area with, where people had no access to health services, the government created a clinic there. Uh, this is part of a, of a mission that, that is called Barrio Dentro, inside of the Shantytown, uh, and, uh, which was, is, is one of the missions that I looked into very carefully. So these are programs managed by the government uh, by volunteers. These volunteers are people affiliated with the, with the government's party and, uh, and they provide services like none of the other government agencies would before. <coughs> so, number three, who pays for the misiones? So the misiones are paid uh, by using oil funds, uh, money coming from oil revenues. Venezuela is an oil economy. More than 70% of the economy depends on oil. Uh, an important uh, aspect to note is that the state, the state owns the oil. It owns the oil company, PDVSA, which is the oil conglomerate. It's a state-owned company that monopolizes the, ex the exploration, the extraction, and the commercialization of oil, or hydrocarbons. Uh, oil is one of the, the many hydrocarbons, perhaps the most, uh, re most relevant or salient. So the funding of the mission has come from oil, from oil revenues. Nobody knows how much the government spends in the misiones. The estimates are that the government has invested around 5% of, of the annual GDP into the social programs. Uh, but the investment of the social programs varies depending on, on, the, on, the, on the political uh, needs, which is uh, the number five that I'm going to address after 
I talk about something else. And uh, so what's really interesting is that the government really has political control over the over PDVSA. In fact, the president of PDVSA is also the Ministry of Mining, and he is also the vice president of the, the Partido Socialista Unido de Venezuela, the, the, so, the, the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, which is the political platform of the government. So this is directly aligned with governments and with, with orders that come from the presidential palace. Moreover, uh, among this, uh, this uh, wave of, of legislation that was passed, uh, many of these laws were passed also to shelter, to create some sort of black box uh, to protect PDVSA and to protect all these extraordinary oil revenues from any external oversight or any congressional control. So, so this is really like a slush fund of the government that is has there's no way to control it. So, so now you see the, the the you see that we're uncovering the real the real meaning of all this social intervention, the prominence of law. So, point number four that I want to make is that the misiones, because of their prominence, because of their centrality, because of the variety of programs that there are, have become a parallel state of sorts. It's really another bureaucracy. So the government, the big question that, that, that people ask and, and there's no clear answer to is how come a government that really controls every aspect of the official bureaucracy, controls every state agency, controls every ministry, has created a parallel state? Because the mission is instead of investing in hospitals, for example, the government has created clinics. And there are clinics that compete with the hospitals. So the hospitals don't get any supplies. The doctors don't get any any benefits or any. No one pays attention to the doctors who work in the hospitals. But those doctors, which are most of the times are, are foreign doctors, mainly Cuban doctors, who are working in the in the octagonales, which is how the these little clinics are called, they get all the resources and all the attention from the state. So it seems as if the state that controls the, the official bureaucracy doesn't really trust on that control over the official bureaucracy, but it does trust on, on its control over this parallel bureaucracy of sorts. So the misiones are really set up in a way, they're, they're created by, by presidential decree. So, so again, you see the, the importance of the law here. So the, law has been, the laws have been enacted to create these programs that are, out, that are outside of the state apparatus. So the misiones have head of the mission, and that head of the mission usually reports directly to the president. <coughs> so orders come directly from the presidential palace. Uh, some ministers are, ministers are connected with the administration to the mission, but those ministers are just symbolically placed there because the mission is really controlled directly by the government. So the creation of a parallel state is, goes hand in hand with this creation of a, of a legal black box. Of a, of a legal black box created by legislation that has been enacted basically to protect all these programs, to protect all the, all the dealings of the government with, uh, from uh, external oversight or any form of external control. Right? And essentially, by virtue of legislation, removing all the checks and balances that would exist in a, in a normal uh, function in democracy. So, what is really behind all of this is that the misiones have, have been used for political gain. There is extensive research done on uh, to prove that the investment of the government, this investment that has been praised by the World Health Organization and some other organizations like that have said, finally someone <coughs> looked at the poor, finally someone delivered. Uh, aid or help directly to the assistance directly to the poor is that the government has really made strategic decisions and had made a strategic investment in social programs. So this is not investment to benefit all the poor. This is investment to benefit only those people that the government believes are going to support the government, are going to become additional supporters of the government. So the research that has been done by others and I have benefited from, from that, is that the government has used the missiones as both purchasing strategies 
in essence, what has happened is that you can see that it, when, we, when Venezuela is near to an electoral time, uh, there is investment or there are more clinics open in certain areas, not the areas that are hard, hardcore chavistas, but the areas that are, might be ambivalent, the people who might be undecided on whether they would like to support Chavez or not support Chavez anymore. So there is a lot of resources invested in those areas. Uh, and, it's, and, it's shift, and, and there's a shift between those areas and then when the, the hardcore Chavistas are complaining that the government forgot about them, then the government will shift and go and invest some in those, in those places. But this is done in a very strategic fashion. It's a very clever way. So it's a very creative way of manipulating the law. So just to end, what the, the, look, when you look at the social problems enacted in Venezuela during the last 10 years, on the surface, what you see is the rule of law in, the, in a symbolic fashion, laws being enacted, the language of rights, the language of, of legal institutions, attention to social problems, which seems, seems to be something that is, is, is working and is beneficial for the welfare of the population. But when you look underneath, what you see is that this is a very clever way of manipulating the, the political, the political uh, environment it is, a, it is only possible when a government controls only, not only the, the, the resources that come to the country, but also controls all the political institutions. So this is a, an instance that I think that, that shows that, that the malleability of law is possible. And the law really, as an instrument, could be an instrument that on the surface is like a Trojan horse. On the surface looks like a benevolent thing. But it, it, uh, inside is not so benevolent. So thank you very much. Well, in fact, you have, you have published in, in 
Menswear. Ja, 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 Um, 
the center of the government. So the government, the way, to, the, the way of describing what the government does is that this is it. No one, nothing else matters, which is also in the undermining the legit legitimacy of its own institutions. But, but it's for a political purpose. But the mission is a joke, the house is a foreign apartment. Well, that's right. But, um, but, but symbolically, it looks, it looks as if the government is really intervening yeah. and helping the people. You know, it, it is for, uh, the only beneficiary has been really the government because and it, it the, has done And the votes. corruption in the people from the government using the money to get richer and richer. In Maracaibo, it was a hospital for children where my, my brother has the wing of the um, best immigration. Yeah, so yeah, we, can, yeah. we can talk more about it. Yeah. If there are more people asking questions. We have a few questions. One of the questions. Okay, yeah. I want to thank you. Uh, I have one question for Rogelio and one question for Manuel. So for Rogelio, um, so maybe I, I missed this point, but it seems that your in your presentation you show that that the institutional response to the problem of this uh, increasing the homicide rate has been not the appropriate one, but I I I didn't I, I didn't hear whether you have an hypothesis about why what are the mechanisms behind the rise of the of the homicide right because I, 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 it seems to me that you're more and uh, maybe your research is focused on more the institutional response to the problem but why in the last years and this is my question why in the last year um, the there has been a, like a significantly increase in the rate of policy. And my question for Manuel is, um, can you say a little bit more about this central role of the law? Because, uh, so are all these laws, laws passed by the Congress through the deliberative process? Because I know like the experience in Chile, for example, when we had this kind of similar governments, was that usually governments were using Presidential regulatory powers to regulate. So maybe more than more than a central role of the law, the case in Venezuela maybe is that there are no deliberative process to to that generates the law, or maybe the presidential the president is using decrees to govern all these areas rather than legislation passed through the Congress. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that because yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, well, I have mentioned that but very quickly. Uh, is that the part of the explanation of the rise in the homicide and violence in general is a policy that I have called empowering the malandro, empowering the the, 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 the the criminals, petty criminals, and so on in the in the shanty towns. Uh, the, the social system in Venezuela is a complex one, but in this shanty town there were hierarchies, and, and the, there were the people that uh, kind of were respected <coughs> in these shanty towns, and they have a certain control. On it. When the government arrived, they uh, it was very interested in recruiting people to support the government, and, and they gave uh, a lot of benefit to them, no? guns. Uh, motorcycle, money, and so on. And that changed the balance within the Chante Town. And the big five are now inside the, the, the Chante Town. This is because they, they uh, this is the, 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 the explanation is this, uh, uh, the empowering the, the mandant and so on. Legislature into one, a unicameral legislation. 
uh, legislature. So, so that way, so Venezuela is one of the what five countries in the world that has a unicameral uh, legislative body. Uh, so whoever controls the single chamber controls everything, and and uh, Chavez's government controls the single chamber does uh, control everything. But uh, so, so some laws, like, like the important laws, the key laws, the, the central bank law, which is what enabled PDVSA to use the, the, the extra revenues and set them aside in a, in a special slush fund for the government, those were passed uh, through a regular process, but there was no deliberation. So usually the bill was uh, presented to the, for the discussion of the National Assembly the day of the, the, where the votes were going to be taken, and uh, there was no time for anyone. The opposition usually had a different version given to them of the, of the actual bill. And the explanation given to them was that, well, this is, you know, there are changes. This is a work in progress. So we're going to add your suggestions and suggestions were never had. So a lot, of the, a lot of the laws that have been passed when they have to be published in the official, the official, in the official Gazette, uh, there, are one, there are two or three versions of the official Gazette. And you never know which one is it. So it, it really it really creates a, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, when I talk about the centrality of the law, it's, it's not really the law as a, as an abstract concept that is, is it has positive values, but it's more the utilization of legal tools. When you would imagine that a government such as this one that has all the money, all the political power, control over every institution, doesn't really need to use law. Why bother? and enacting to enact a decree, why bother to enact extraordinary legislation if you can do it without legislation? So what's really intriguing is why is it that a government that, that has, is clearly a, a, an arbitrary government in many ways, why is it that it, it has relied on presidential decrees, which is a, a type of regulatory powers that you were talking about exactly that, uh, usually, the, the way to do it is that the government, the president has gotten uh, extraordinary powers to issue emergency legislation, and that emergency legislation is, you know, 49 decrees that deal with everything. So that is a, that is the meaning of the of, of the of the manipulation that I talked about. So I don't know if it's clear or not. We have time for just one more question. Well, I have a general question. You know, she asked for why the vote was not published in Venezuela. It relates to all of you anyway. So the, the basic law that I think is violated in Venezuela that, that it encompasses the three of you and most of us is that there is no freedom, of, there is no access to information which is granted in the Constitution. You know, you said that you, could, you don't have access to information. You don't. And you, and for the case of uh, the judicial, the more, <coughs> I don't know how you call that in the more, you call it in English, the more. There's no access. It's denied to the newspapers. They deny the account for the homicides. There's there's no way we can really know the number. We know it's huge in homicides and crime, but we we don't have access to information. So the government violates every single the basic law for all of us in common. We have no access to missions. We have no access to the bank, the central bank. We have no access to the devices, you know, uh, financial accounts. So it's. Basically, I, I think my, my question is how do you work at it, uh, for, uh, how can you work against the government when the, he acts against you? I mean, in every aspect. I don't know if you see any way of attack, uh, you know, of coming out, out of this by law. Laura, can you say the one? Yes, I think we So we'll just take these last two. Yeah, I, I well, I'm thankful for you guys uh, talking about this stuff. And just uh, one specific question, then one general question. The specific was, I was under the impression that uh, there's a guy named Mark Weisbrock, uh, uh -huh. who's the Guardian, who's uh, presenting in Congress. And he said that the October 4th was saying that over 90% of the, the media channels are not government controlled. There is not this uh, such strong. So is, is that incorrect or correct? So I was asked, you Over, that? What was the number? Ninety. Over. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that that's correct. What we have seen is, first of all, the government acquiring more and more uh, media outlets, so radio, television, newspapers, uh, and um, for the four main TV stations that we had before, um, they were all independent. Uh, so one was.
shut down, the other two changed their editorial lines. We're still in private hands, but are not broadcasting information against the government. And yeah. there's only one left. So I think it was fine. And it was it's yeah, it's fine and it's um, So you can't buy you can't sign up for local cable or something like that and kind of get out of the government loop. So cable is still a possibility. Yeah. Uh, but they're they're just discussing a new law to regulate to force cable to, uh, yeah, to, to transmit the cadenas and so Yeah, but nobody, so no many people have cable access, it's expensive. Right. And, and, and my other question, just in general for, for all of you, um, I'm interested in, in your democracy, and I'm, I'm sad it's, it's not working as well. Luckily, we have a great one here, and there's no corruption whatsoever. We always follow the little wall, so that's, you know. But um, I'm, I'm curious. You know, it seems like in, in your country there's the, the people and then the, the bourgeoisie. Uh, and and the, or is that what you, the word you were using, the, the bourgeoisie? Yes, no, that's where the time is. Exactly, just, right. And so it, it's the middle and upper middle classes and upper classes, right? My guess is that you folks are, are probably from the middle and upper middle classes. But not that, but, but the interesting the interesting observation, and I'm glad you know that, is that there is a new bourgeoisie, the Bolivarian bourgeoisie. Uh -huh. So so what, what what you can note in Venezuela and now you can now you can see it, because the government has been around for what fourteen years. 14 years. Or so, so so now you, you see a, a, a political elite that that really grew out of this government. So a lot of the social programs, you know, there's a, a kickback, and there's a guy who provides mm -hmm. for this and that. So what's really interesting is that there is this new, I've done research on social networks and how they're used to you know, manipulate certain things. And, and what I have observed in those, in those cases is that the old networks were wiped out. So people were prosecuted, were, were chased away and all that. But those places, it's as if everybody left the room, but the chairs stayed in the room, and those chairs or those seats have been taken by other people Refills. who are now, uh, you know, people who are aligned with the government. At least are pra they're pragmatics who have made tons of money and have attained political power. So that the 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 difference with respect to the past is that there used to be corruption, there used to be this uh, manipulation by networks and all that, but there was. It, interestingly enough, there was this counterbalance. There was this, this check. It was like people had, there were territories or turfs or, or now they're not turfs or territories because it's really a hierarchical thing that comes, you know, from the top down. So it's that is worse. Now, that, which, is, which is worse in a way. Yeah, I think we just have one last question. So when I started the research, I, I, I thought that people would turn on the television. So um, when the data started, so I checked the numbers, and actually only 30% of the people, you know, turn on the television. And so the explanation, which is a relatively small number, when you think that the data goes on for hours, and normally you're, it, it goes, it's typically at in prime time. So Venezuelans are watching either a soap opera or you know a sports match. So. The explanation that I that I got from this is that so Chavez is a celebrity in Venezuela. He's an entertainer. The cadena goes on for hours. So people usually like tune out and tune, tune you know you won't watch the cadena for the whole seven hours, but even if you're in the opposition, you'll watch the cadena because it's it's funny, it's fun. You wanna know you wanna know what's gonna happen. Sometimes when Chavez is not on TV, you're you're desperate to know you're like, what what's happening. If he, we haven't seen him on TV for the last week, something's really wrong. So you're used to seeing him. So he's been there's been this study that qualifies him as the the typical telepresident, so president. So this is a new way of governing where he's really a celebrity and and you need to watch him. You want to watch him, even if, if you're criticizing him, you still you know tune in and watch him for a long time. So even though he loses some of the audience, the the political effect at the end is extremely positive for him because people at least seventy percent of them are you know, seven, seven out of ten people keep watching the video. So it's not actually acceptance of the ideas, it's more awareness of the existence of him being there all the time. It's like Big Brother. Yeah. He's, 
he's always here. Well, also because big important decisions are announced in the Italian. Sometimes yeah. it says, you know, there's going to be a new law, you're going to be fired, you're going to be indicted tomorrow. Yeah. So okay. you have to, you have to be on the, if you are, if you have to be on the know. <laughs> and you're in the spectrum. As far as you're saying, you were right? You were mentioning <laughs> <laughs> I was insulted. <laughs> <laughs>